Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Anvit Nanavati, and the topic I'll be presenting today is multiple sclerosis. It's a case I had seen in my second week of rotation, and it is quite interesting since a couple of other features was also present in the patient. And I'm thankful for MIQT for this opportunity. So the first is the case itself. The patient is a 56-year-old male. He was right-handed, ex-military. His work was administrative and clerical in nature. He was single, and he had severe bilateral visual impairment, which is why it was his niece who drove him to work for the consult. The patient was already diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, but since certain antibody testings were done, such as anti-MOGAD, as well as autoimmune encephalitis, but mainly anti-MOGAD being borderline, the diagnosis was changed to MOGAD, which is myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody associated disease. And for a second opinion, the patient had sought consult with us. Regarding clinical features are merged the physical findings and history in which patient mentioned severe visual impairment in bilaterally both the eyes, bilateral hand tremors, precipitant incontinence, which the patient mentioned going to the bathroom three to four times every night and ending up selling himself if he can't reach the bathroom on time, numbness as well as tingling on the lower extremities, as well as severe debilitating retroorbital pain, which on average the patient mentioned it being nine out of 10 on the pain scale, along with headaches which are intermittent in nature and more in the frontal area. Regarding family history, on the paternal side, the patient had the patient's father had diabetes mellitus as well as hypertension. As for the mother or the maternal side, the patient mentioned no complaints and no disorders being present. As for past history, I merged it with past medical history and past surgical history. So in the past medical history, the patient had diabetes mellitus, which he mentioned being under control through lifestyle modifications and diet and no meds whatsoever. As for hypertension, the patient was taking an ACE inhibitor or ramipril. The patient was also diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, also known as OSA, for which CPAP was initiated, but he was not comfortable with the same, which is why he discontinued it voluntarily. The patient also mentioned constipation being quite frequent, as well as mild GERD or acid reflux being present as well. And the past surgical history, the patient mentioned hernia surgery being done in 2007. Regarding the outline, I'll be covering various topics, including the overview, history, epidemiology, etiology, the pathophysiology, as well as the clinical features, the diagnostic McDonald's criteria, as well as subtypes of multiple sclerosis, along with the typical findings on the MRI for the same, as well as a few differential diagnoses, and finally, treatment. Regarding an overview for multiple sclerosis, Multiple sclerosis is an inflammatory autoimmune mediated disorder which generally targets the central myelinated cells, also known as oligodendrocytes, which form the myelin in the CNS or central nervous system. It leads to a progressive demyelination, which would end up damaging certain cranial nerves as well, mainly the second cranial nerve or the optic nerve, which would lead to subsequent optic neuritis or severe visual impairment, which is also seen in our case. Disability is quite common in a magnitude of patients, but significant disability is seen in around 30% of cases, which is usually seen 20 to 25 years after the onset of symptoms. It is usually seen five years earlier in females, which corroborates with a three to one female to male ratio for multiple sclerosis. Other features also include autonomic dysfunction, visual disturbances, as well as sensory motor deficits which are very commonly seen as numbness, tingling, or paralysis. One of the hallmark features of multiple sclerosis is the lesions which are disseminated in space and time, which means the lesions are usually months to years apart from each other. Regarding the history, the earliest documented case was in the year 1395, in which, as mentioned and seen over here, the picture indicates Saint Lidwina Skidim, who was the first case as seen in 1395, while she suffered a serious rib injury 
while ice skating over a frozen canal around 15 years of age. Clinical features at that point of time was weakness in the lower limbs, intermittent headaches, as well as dentalgia, which is nothing but teeth pain. Four years later, at 19 years of age, severe visual impairment was noted bilaterally, as well as paralysis of the lower limbs was quite evident. Over the next 34 years, the variant and features progressed and relapsed, for which he was given the diagnosis of a relapsing remitting variant of multiple sclerosis. Around 52 years of age, the features worsened, to which unfortunately she succumbed to a death at the same time. Regarding the epidemiology, in the United States, there are more than 900,000 cases of multiple sclerosis. The annual incidence for the same being 2.1 for every 100,000 cases. The peak incidence is usually around 20 to 40 years of age or the second to fourth decade of life. Corroborating with the previous ratio, the female to male ratio is 3 is to 1. Regarding the geographical and racial distribution, it's more commonly found in populations from Northern Europe, Northern United States, as well as Southern Canada. Regarding the etiology, as mentioned, it's an autoimmune condition and also various environmental as well as genetic factors also play a role secondarily for an onset of multiple sclerosis. For the environmental factors, I've divided them under strong, moderate, and weak. The first two for strong being a prior Epstein-Barr virus exposure or cigarette smoking. For the moderate exposures, it is low sun exposure or vitamin D deficiency, as well as high polyunsaturated fatty acid intake. Ufas are rich in or more commonly seen in flaxseed, fish oil, as well as sesame seed. Regarding weak factors, air pollution, as well as gaseous organic solvents are quite common. Weak factors, but nevertheless, can be regulated to multiple sclerosis. Regarding the genetic factors, there are multiple MHC complex two genetic variants found First being HLA DRB1 asterisk 1501, which in itself would increase the risk of developing multiple sclerosis by threefold. And this is more commonly found in the population of Northern Europe as well as African Americans. The next three variants don't increase the risk by threefold, but nevertheless have a predilection to develop the onset of MS, which would be HLA DRB1 asterisk 0301. 0405 and 1303, all three being commonly found in Mediterranean population. And the last MHC complex two, which is protective in nature, is HLA A asterisk O2, which is commonly found in Northern and Central Indians. A few epigenetic and genomic allelic variants in the form of genetic rearrangements or single nucleotide polymorphisms is also predelegating to multiple sclerosis. Regarding the pathophysiology, genetic factors, environmental factors, as well as infectious triggers play a role. So initially, these cells activate the myelin Th1 and Th17 cells, respectively being macrophages as well as neutrophils. These cells then infiltrate the central nervous system, which will lead to elevated levels of B cells, plasma cells, as well as T lymphocytes. So it's the B cells that is responsible for disrupting the blood-brain barrier, leading to widening endothelial gap junctions, which now would lead to the ability for T lymphocytes to directly enter the central nervous system and target the central nervous system, repairing myelin cells or oligodendrocytes. This further leads to CNS tissue damage and worsening neurological dysfunction. To further elaborate on the blood-brain barrier disruption are divided under cell-mediated antimoral immunity, being T and B cell, respectively. So under the cell-mediated, the CD4 cells, along with the macrophages of the Th1 cells, give rise and increase the amount of interferon gamma, which is a pro-inflammatory marker. This in turn acts as a cycle and increases activated macrophage levels, which would further damage the central nervous oligodendrocyte cells. This in turn would further increase another set of pro-inflammatory markers 
that being tumor necrosis factor alpha. Simultaneously, CD4 cells with Th17 cells get activated as well. Neutrophils are indirectly activated through interleukin-17 through a neutrophil monocyte chemotaxis cycle. Simultaneously, humoral immunity or B cells are also activated through autoreactive B cells as well as plasma cells, which now give rise to oligoclonal antibodies, both of these being myelin-specific at a central nervous system, which would then attack the myelin sheath as well as the oligodendrocytes, leading to progressive demyelination. As for the clinical features, numbness and tingling is very common and usually generalized, especially over the lower extremities. Optic neuritis is quite common, leading to severe visual impairment, bilateral in some cases. Retroorbital pain is almost always accompanied on the pain scale being over 8 on 10, or severe debilitating. Diplopia and nystagmus are quite common as well, diplopia indicating double vision. Lomit sign is also quite characteristic for multiple sclerosis. Lomit sign being flexion of the neck, giving rise to electric shock-like sensation, which goes down to the spine, could go to the legs and the arms, or even the trunk. Tremors and dysarthrias are quite common and are more commonly seen in the progressive variants, indicating cerebellar involvement. Another classic phenomenon is the Utah phenomenon in which excessive heat or worsening episodes of increased body temperature give rise to worsening symptoms of optic neuritis. Maybe in the form of fever, infections, hot sauna, anything that is the body temperature would worsen the optic neuritis as well as the internuclear ophthalmoplegia. Another feature seen in around 20% of cases is the charcoal stride. That includes nystagmus, intentional tremor, as well as a scanning type of speech, also known as staccato speech. An afferent pupillary defect is also quite commonly seen, which would indicate dilation of the pupils bilaterally upon shining light in the affected eye. Babinski's sign is also quite commonly seen and is usually a sign of an upper motor neuron lesion as well. The Babinski sign can be elicited by stroking the lateral plantar aspect of the foot which would then lead to dorsiflexion of the hallux of the big toe and fanning out of all the other toes, being positive for the same. And finally, precipitin incontinence, which is also seen in our patient, indicating multiple times of frequent, increased frequency, but ending up swelling himself with the inability to control the urge. Regarding the McDonald's criteria, as mentioned here, there are five pathways. One of them is two or more clinical attacks with at least two or more lesions seen on the MRI scan, one of them being due to a prior attack of multiple sclerosis. In this pathway, gen generally, additional criteria is not needed where clinical evidence will be suffice, but if any future evidence comes, it should be consistent with multiple sclerosis. Another pathway, again, two or more clinical attacks with at least one lesion being found clinically on the MRI. But this lesion under additional criteria has to be disseminated in space with respect to a subsequent lesion found in a future attack at a different site. The third pathway would be just one clinical attack, but at least two or more lesions found on the MRI again. In this scenario, the lesions have to be disseminated in time which would mean the lesions should be at least months to years apart from each other or wait for another attack to differentiate the same. Another pathway would be one clinical attack with just one lesion on the MRI scan. But in this scenario, the lesion has to be disseminated in space as well as time, indicating a different location and a wider time period between the subsequent attack. And the final pathway being no clinical attacks, indicating no further worsening or progression from onset of symptoms. But in this scenario, the period should be more than one year of stagnant or stable features, as well as the lesions have to be at least one on a T2 MRI in areas including the periventricular, juxtacortical, or the infratentorial regions. Again, have to be disseminated in space. 
or a positive CSF should be found with oligoclonal banding. Regarding the subtypes of multiple sclerosis, one of the three major variants is the relapsing remitting type or the RRMS. In this, discrete intermittent episodes are usually seen with further worsening of neurological features. But in this scenario, the periods of relapsing and remitting vary between weeks and months. As for the graph, the orange bar graphs indicate a relapsing episode with the blue line indicating an active episode without any worsening, with a subsequent orange followed by a red line, which indicates worsening with incomplete recovery from the previous relapse. And then the subsequent dark blue line in the end indicating a stable feature and progressive episode without any active phase. Regarding the second, secondary progressive variant, also known as SPMS, this usually follows a prior um, uh, RRMS episode, which would indicate a relapsing remitting type. So usually they initiate or are seen initially with a relapsing remitting episode, which then progresses to a secondary progressive variant. In this scenario, decline is acute without any periods of dormancy, which is usually seen as a relapsing episode in the pre previous mentioned subtype. And around one to 2% of secondary progressive variants progress from relapsing remitting to the secondary progressive variant every year. The graph indicating the same, the gray line being a relapsing remitting episode, which then turned into a secondary progressive with an active phase seen as a red line along with relapse and progression, followed by an active phase without any progression denoted by the orange graph. And then followed by a green indicating progression without any current activity. A blue line would indicate a stable episode followed by again cycle of active episodes. And both of these variants are in the major variants and have a female predelication with a ratio of three to one. Regarding the primary progressive, around 10% of total cases come under this variant. At the same time, the decline is very steady. The distribution of sex is equal, unlike the other two, being one is to one in this case. But the features are usually seen after the third decade of life, later in onset, but more severe and debilitating. As seen by the graph, there is no relapsing period here, and the active phase directly starts with the red line, followed by a stable phase indicated by the blue line, and an inactive phase with progression nevertheless by the green line followed by a subsequent active phase with progression denoted by the red line again, and a light blue line indicating active phase without any further progression. Another variant, although rare, is seen in multiple sclerosis and is known as the Marburg variant. It's a very fulminant cause and it's a variant which is very dreadful as it's multifocal in nature, quite close to the onset of symptoms. If I proceed to the other features, I would like to bring attention to you the MRI scans on the right, figure A and B being of the same person with just one month apart in terms of onset of features. In the figure A, the onset is acute with lesions being present bilaterally and at least three centimeters or more in size. And in just one year, without any medication or treatment sought, the lesions have taken up 25 to 30% of the brain size and have increased in width as well as length, worsening the features to a point where the features now progress to encephalopathies, severe motor and sensory deficits. Seizures and aphasias are quite common in this scenario. Lesions bilaterally enhanced. And if treatment and consultation is not sought on time, death could ensue within one year of onset of symptoms. Regarding the MRI findings, figure A indicates, as mentioned, an axial T2 weighted MRI. In this scenario, the lesions denoted as a white enhancing mass is high signal intensity active lesions, which would in indicate a lesion disseminated in space in relation to the lesions below those respective ones, which are appearing gray, which are usually due to a prior attack, being characteristically seen as disseminated in space as well as time. In figure two, 
the sagittal T2 flare weighted MRI. It's a T2 flare inverted. So CSF would appear darker in this image and edema and lesions appear white. In this case, lesions being white and commonly seen at the anterior colossum, which is also characteristically seen in multiple sclerosis. Figure C would indicate sagittal T2 fast spin echo MRI, the arrow pointing at a fusiform shaped lesion, which is usually found in a thoracic region, also denoted by this MRI, which is the cause of low mid sign in this patient due to a lesion found in thoracic spine. And finally, figure D, a sagittal T1 weighted MRI. The C shaped structures or the hypocyclic intensity structures indicating a blood brain barrier disruption due to the B cells, as mentioned earlier, leading to the entry of T cells, which damage the oligodendrocytes or the myelin forming cells of the central nervous system. And in this scenario, IV gadolinium was used as contrast, which is why you can see the disruption quite clearly, which is also commonly seen in modern sclerosis. As for the differential diagnosis, I want to include a few conditions which are quite mixed up with multiple sclerosis, the features being quite similar due to the fact that initially they were considered to be progressive variants of multiple sclerosis, but through research and seeing more cases of the same, they were diagnosed and mentioned as complete distinct conditions on their own. The two being neuromyelitis optica and myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody associated disease. And for the sake of discussion, I'll be talking about all these conditions in the short form for multiple sclerosis being MS, neuromyelitis optica being NMO, and for the latter being MOGAD. So the median age of onset for MS would be the second decade of life, for it being third decade for NMO and fourth decade or a later onset for MOGAD. Regarding sex distribution, there's a higher female preponderance to be exact a ratio of the same three is to one, female is to male, in both MS and NMO. And for MOGAD, the distribution is equal, indicating a female to male ratio being one is to one. Regarding optic neuritis, the features are usually unilateral for most cases and bilaterally seen for NMO as well as MOGAD. Regarding steroid dependency, all of them are quite dependent on steroids, but with the frequency being very high for MOGAD, being very frequent and just borderline common or mildly frequent for MS and NMO. Under MRI chias mill involvement, it may or may not be involved in MS, but it's frequently involved in NMO and very frequently seen in MOGAD. Regarding antibody testing, that's usually reserved for NMO and MOGAD, but this, for the sake of this discussion, I've also included it for MS being IgG1 and IgG3 antibodies being present for MS. Acroporin-4 IgG being present for NMO and an antibody to MOG IgG for MOGAD. Regarding the risk of severe visual impairment in MS, it may or may not be present, to be exact, seen in around 20% of cases, but it's very frequently seen in NMO. And once again, infrequent or less common in MOGAD, similar to MS. Regarding cognitive decline, MS shows some frequency of cognitive decline being present in the same, whereas cognitive decline is absent for the most part in NMO and MOGAD. And the treatment are divided it as mainstay and symptomatic. So under mainstay, ocrelizumab is quite effective and it's a CD20 monoclonal antibody given 600 milligrams IV every six months, with it distributed as 300 milligrams between two weeks of gap when given for the first time, followed by IV metalprednisolone 100 milligrams prior to the infusion. This in turn prevents infusion related reactions. Ocrelizumab also had a small tendency of developing breast cancers in patients which are seen preclinical trials, but post marketing surveillance indicates no sign of the same, which would indicate it being safe and having no relation to the onset of new breast cancers. Regarding natalizumab, that's another frequently used drug, which is an interferon drug, 300 milligrams IV each month. 
but in this case you should check for signs of jc virus being present as a zero conversion in the patients as jc virus or john cunningham virus is usually found in immunocompromised people on around 30 percent of immunocompetent people and this can lead to progressive multifocal myeloencephalopathies which is quite commonly seen with this virus hence natalizumab should be used with caution and zero conversion should be done every four to six months for the same. The last being glatiramir acetate, which is not as effective as the first two, but nonetheless is moderately effective. And it's given at a dose of 20 milligrams subcutaneously once a day or 40 milligrams thrice a week. Glatiramir acetate also has side effects of palpitations, flushing, or even lipohydrophy. So that should be checked out before proceeding for treatment with glatiramir acetate. Regarding symptomatic treatment, for spasticity, baclofen is used around 20 to 120 milligrams per day, or benzodiazepams, mainly diazepam being 2 to 40 milligrams per day. Regarding dysastasias, which commonly present as pruritus, tingling or numbness, or any cutaneous feature, is well controlled with carbamazepine at a dose of between 100 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams or one gram a day. For precipitin incontinence, oxybutynin, which is an M3 anticholinergic, is commonly used at a dose of five to 15 milligrams per day. And finally, for the tremors, propanolol as well as clonazepam can be used. Propanolol being 20 to 120 milligrams per day or clonazepam being used 0.5 to six milligrams per day. Thank you everyone for paying attention. This is my last slide and please feel free to ask any questions if any.